come over here, Mama. So we are so happy to have Joyce Henderson with us today. And um, Joyce, we she has a, a history. She has a history here in Oklahoma City and uh, the civil rights uh, history of Oklahoma City going all the way back to 1958. So she is going to be sharing her story with us today. And I remember Joyce, I don't know how long we've been having Martin Luther King celebrations at St. Paul's, but at least 15 years, maybe even uh, up to 20 years. And I remember seeing her every year. And so we remember each other from those events. And I always recognize Joyce with her wonderful, inviting smile. <laughs> and I always, Thank you. Yes, I always wanted to get to know her. And so now we've had the chance to know each other a little bit. And we have found some common history in that our mothers are both um, older and having some difficulties. So we have begun praying for each other's mother in our getting to know each other. Uh, so it is, it is my pleasure to introduce her. And we, um, we're also going to be hearing about uh, the Clara Looper uh, projects that she has going on. And then we have a part three where Joyce is going to let us know about some things that we might do as we uh, try in our own way to eradicate racism. So that will be part three. So Joyce, um, it is my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And on this Sunday morning, it's a good morning because we're all here together. And I'm gonna open up with this. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, walking to the freedom land. And that's one of the songs we did as young people when we gathered to pick it downtown. But I'm just gonna open up in case many of you don't know who I am. I am Joyce Ann Henderson. My maiden name is Johnson. My parents are Eddie and Fannie Mae Johnson, and they reside in Spencer, where I grew up in the community of Green Pastures. So I am an Oklahoman, and I am 73 years old, and I love purple. Anytime you see me, I will be in purple. So that's a little bit. I graduated from Dungey High School. And that's where I attended elementary, junior high, and senior high. And that's where my journey began with Clara Lupa. But before that poet, uh, let me just share that I am a graduate of Langston University. I have my master's degree from then Central State University and my administration certification from the University of Oklahoma. And my background, many know me from being a teacher, principal in the Oklahoma City Public Schools. The schools I've served as principal, high school principal would be Emerson Alternative High School, the old Classen High School, Northeast High School, Star Spencer High School, and then I went back to open up the first magnet school in Oklahoma City Public Schools, and that was Class and School of Advanced Studies. So you can see I've been around. I've been retired, going on 15 years, uh, retiring back in 2006. Uh, and at that time, I was serving on the superintendent staff as the executive director of school and community services. At first it was called school and community affairs, but they told me I was having too much fun with that word affairs. So they changed it to services. <laughs> but at any rate, let me go back to why it's so important for us to have this conversation. If it hadn't been for Clara Lupa, where would we be? And that's why it's important for us to have the conversation because although the original 13, and I was not one of the original 13, but I was a participant. If it hadn't been for the original 13 sit-in or say, 
why can't we have the same privileges as others? And the only reason we didn't have those privileges because of the color of our skin. And when you start talking about the color of your skin, you had nothing to do with the color of your skin. I had nothing to do with the color of my skin. But somehow society has divided us because of the color of our skins, not even because of our character, because of the color of our skin. So when you have this conversation, and I go back to how I got involved in the civil rights and sit-in movement. And if it hadn't been for Clara Lopa being my history teacher at Dungy School, I don't know where I would be. But she invited all of her students to be participants in the civil rights. As young people, and I was in, in junior high, we didn't call it middle school back then. But we knew something was wrong with being segregated. It didn't take a rocket scientist to know that something was wrong with that picture. So when she invited us to join the NAACP Youth Council, we took advantage of that. And that's how I got involved in the civil rights movement. Because of her leadership, she did become my mentor. And I can tell you, she has impacted my life in many ways. I graduated from Langston University. I majored in social studies, and that's what she taught. I also taught at Dungy School. That's where she taught. After I graduated from Langston, I was able to go back and teach history at my old high school, and that was an honor. And finishing that task while there, I was the cheerleader sponsor. She was my cheerleader sponsor. And I can tell you, when she was our sponsor, we hated it because she made up yells we didn't like. But she was the one calling the shots when it was a football game or a basketball game, telling us which yell. And let me share one yell with you that we wanted to go under the stadium every time she would say, okay, Boomalaka. We said Boomalaka, we hated it. Again, she wrote it. And this is the way it goes. Boomalaka, boomalaka, bow, wow, wow. Chickalaka, chickalaka, chow, chow, chow. Boomalaka, chickalaka, who are we? Dungy Tigers, yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Now, let me tell you, we hated that yell then. But today, when we have school reunions, all you have to do is say boomalaka. And we know the person that we are honoring when we say boomalaka. So it has become part of our trademark when we have our all school reunions uh, with Dungy School. But going on with that, under her leadership, I had the opportunity to participate and be the song leader at one time with the um, NAACP Youth Council. And being the song leader meant you got ready for the sit-ins that took place downtown. Uh, many of you know the history. We met at Calvary Baptist Church on 2nd and Walnut, and that's where we would gather to get instructions from Clara Lupa uh, that day. You didn't participate in the city and movement without being obedient. And if you knew Clara Lupa, you were going to be obedient or you were not going to be a participant. I can assure you that. So we were well uh, disciplined. And again, the experience or the experiences I had as a child being a part of the civil rights movement, I tell people priceless. I cannot describe uh, the feeling or feelings I had being a part of that. And I can assure you at the time we were doing it, we weren't thinking of we're making history. We just knew we were doing something that was right. And that was to change laws that segregated people because of the color of their skins. Again, something was wrong with that picture. But as I go through that experience, being a participant in the city in March, I also had the opportunity to participate in the March on Washington. And that was in 19, August 28, 1963. Again, Miss Lupa took two buses from Oklahoma City. Now, you know, we didn't have social media back then. And when she invited her students to participate, it wasn't that we had money because 
we went on donations to attend the March on Washington to hear Dr. Martin Luther King's speech. And at that time, really, we weren't hearing that it was going to be Dr. Martin Luther King speaking. We were going to the Civil Rights March in Washington, D.C. Now, coming from Green Pastures, I had no idea how many thousands of people would be gathered at that event. Not one race of people, but many races of people having the same issues, having the same discussions, wanting equal rights, wanting the same rights as everybody, uh, regardless of race, creed, or color. So at any rate, uh, had that opportunity. And of course, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And I had the opportunity to go back 50 years later to uh, commemorate that event. And I tried to stand in the same area I stood 50 years earlier. Now that's, that is historical, a historic moment for me. So having that experience, and of course, we did not know at that time, when we heard Dr. King deliver the speech, the tragedy that would take place in his life later on in 1968. Now that was in 1963. And I can tell you, uh, I tell people, yes, I heard the speech in 1963, but I really, and I was 16 years old at that time, but I really didn't understand the speech and those words until after his death. And I know you say, well, how can that happen? It can happen. Young people, we listen to a lot of things but the meaning can come later in life. So I can hear the speech today and still get a different meaning from the speech that he delivered. So that was an experience I cherished and I'm proud that I had the opportunity to be one of the persons in that 250,000 number to hear him in person not on television, not on radio. And every time I see pictures, I'm looking for me in the crowd. But of course, of course I can't find me, but I'm still looking for me in the crowd. So that's an experience. Now to go back to where we are here in Oklahoma City, I am proud that we have and still recognize the leadership of Clara Lupa and what the civil rights movement did for Oklahoma City, for this state, and for this nation. And I say that because her legacy continues. I am part of three organizations right now continuing the legacy of Clara Lupa and the civil rights movement. I'm on the Clara Lupa Legacy Committee and that legacy committee, a group of volunteers led under the leadership of her daughter, Marilyn Lupa Hildred. And of course, her three children are still living. Uh, Calvin Lupa still lives in Oklahoma City. And her youngest daughter is Shelley Lupa Wilson. And she lives in the Dallas area in Texas. So at any rate, that's the one organization that I've been a part of for a long time, the Clara Lupa Legacy Committee. And the second committee is the Freedom Center. And that's the one that uh, we're going to expand because of MAPS 4 that was passed, will include the Clara Lupa Civil Rights Center. And again, keeping her legacy alive. And the third committee I'm affiliated with is the Clara Lupa Plaza, where the old cat store was located. And it's right in that area next to the Internal Revenue on Main Street in Robinson. Uh, we're getting ready. I'm on a committee under the leadership of John Kennedy and Pastor Cooper. We are going to erect a statue along with the 13 children in that area, again, keeping her legacy alive. So those are the three organizations that I'm still affiliated with because we know the importance and you have now 
witness different organizations giving Clara Lupa her tribute. And as I said earlier, what she has done for this city, for this state and for this nation, you cannot say enough thanks for her leadership. So I'm going to close with that. And I call that a summary because I can go on and on and on talking about the civil rights movement and where we are. But I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions that you really would like to hear from me, answers from me. Okay, Miss Susan. Okay, thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, and um, I, let's see, I, I, we have some people here in Dean Willie Hall, and if any of you have questions, please shout them out and I will repeat them. I, mm -hmm. I, I'll get it started, if you don't mind, uh, because I wanted to hear when we were having our conversation and, and I said to you um, that so many people from the congregation have come to clergy saying, we want to do something, we want to do something, what can we do? And uh, when I asked you that question, what can people do if they want to help, want to get involved? And you mentioned something about um, changing people's hearts one at a time. Right. And I would love for you to talk a little bit, flesh that out a little bit more, if you would, for us. So many times we think of the big picture and we don't think about little things we can do. It's amazing how the person next to you can be changed. All of us, we, regardless of your race, we know somebody with attitudes needing to be changed. And those attitudes are negative, mean, mean-spirited, and if we can just change one person, we are making a contribution to changing a race of people. One thing I have known, once you associate with other people, it changes a lot of the stereotypes that we may have. I recall as a kid, if you haven't been exposed to other races, then you go with what you have heard. And I used to ask myself, my gosh, white people all look alike. How can you tell them apart? And I recall the answer saying, well, they're probably looking at you asking the same question. And that is so true. But once you are in the presence on a regular basis, et cetera, you get to know the person as an individual, not as a class of people. But I just know the importance of changing hearts first. And when you change a person's heart, you're changing the character of people. And that was the, the main recommendation I had, Susan, when you start talking about what can we do. You don't have to look at something on a magnet, on a big scale. Look at the little things you do. It's amazing if you just said hello to another race. <laughs> it may shock them. You may not have done that, but do something out of your comfort zone and you'd be surprised. It becomes natural. And once it becomes natural, it's nothing for you to speak to me every day. It's nothing for you to say, how's your family? What have you been doing? a conversation where you get to know the person as a person and not as a race, okay? That's great, thank you so much. Baby steps, little steps. Little and steps, little we don't steps. big steps. steps. They become big steps then after a while. So that's, that that's is right. wonderful. Mm -hmm. I would look out to my um, others in the crowd to see if there are questions there that you might have. Did you hear that, Joyce? 
No, oh, I can't hear it at all. So repeat it. I'll repeat it. Um, it. Of the three organizations that you mentioned, the Legacy Committee, the Freedom Center, and the and the Plaza, uh, are is there anything that any of us can do with any of those three to become involved if we would like to? You will. You will hear from time to time announcements. Um, and, and when I say announcements, not it's not about money all the time. Uh, there are times, for an example, when we had the voting, the Clara Lupa Legacy Committee led the voting campaign in a small way, meaning we made phone contacts, et cetera. Those are things you can do uh, just by making a phone call from your home to encourage people to vote ABC. But there are also things, once we get the Civil Rights Center up and open and the plaza up and open, I'm sure you will hear announcements of needing volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not always about needing your money as much as we need your resources and need you as a volunteer to help in various ways. I cannot be specific now. And the reason I cannot be specific because everything is developing as I speak to you now. And what, what, what do you mean? Well, the Civil Rights Center hopefully will be an educational center within itself. And we're hoping to have young people come through there and be educated on what it means to be uh, civil rights workers to be a part of a nation where the color of your skin is not going to divide you, but include you. I love to share the story, and I don't know if you can see this. This is the U.S. Constitution pocketbook. And why is it so important? I do a lot of speaking to uh, high school, middle school, elementary students on the civil rights and the city and movement. I also like to share with them this constitution. I take enough so they can have their own constitution. And of course, these were complimentary books that you could get from the Oklahoma Bar Association. They had to stop printing them, but uh, that was going to take place. This would be the first year that they were not going to be able to give them out. But why is so important? because the Constitution of the United States guarantees not one race of people, but every race of people, if you are a citizen of the United States, certain rights. And when people would ask, was it legal for you to sit in and do all of that back in the day? The Constitution, First Amendment, that's why you see many, many, marches today because it is a right that you have, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble in the Constitution. The First Amendment gives you that right. The First Amendment gave us the right to pick it because that was just, we're citizens of the United States and I'd like to share that message with young people. It doesn't matter who you are, but know that if you are a citizen of the United States, you do have the we the people rights and I'm just sharing that right now but with the three organizations back to that uh, there are things you can do I cannot be specific at this moment but you will hear them uh, in in the uh, media soon enough thank you thanks I and you know uh, as you mentioned Joyce about the bar association not now printing those but I bet Go online and find a copy of that. Uh, yes. You you can go online, but they were doing it free. Uh -huh. And if you go online, they were charging like, I think for this particular one, I think it was a dollar for each one. But that was the, the joy I had going to the Bar Association, telling them how many students I would be talking to and they would give me however many copies I needed because I wanted each student to have his or her own copy. And they were able to 
allowed me to get that many copies. And I appreciate the Bar Association right there on 19th and Lincoln, North Lincoln. And so because of budget, they explained to me that they were not going to be in that position in the future. They also provided these pocket constitutions for any school that requested them, but they did say they were going to have to stop. I love seeing those big, we the people, it's in big letters, you cannot miss it. <laughs> you miss it, and, and that, it didn't say we the people because you're black, we the people because you're Caucasian, we the people because you're Hispanic, and it goes on, it says we the people, and we're all the people, and that's the beauty of the Constitution. The people, because we are the people. That's right. We are the people. <laughs> okay. Questions. And we're looking for questions. Anyone? Let Let me share a little bit, uh, Susan. Yes. When I When I was picketing, and and also I'm in the I'm in the film called Children of the Civil Rights documentary film. And I don't know how many of you know Julia Clifford. She's the executive director. And of course, her father, Bill Clifford, one of the first uh, whites to participate in the city and movement. Uh, that particular film has been on time. She produced it about eight or nine years ago. But how appropriate it is to see that a documentary film now. And what it does, it reflects back on the city in that started here in 1958. In fact, we just celebrated the 62nd anniversary of the Oklahoma City city in. Now, let me tell you something that is important for you to know. Many people really thought the first city in took place in Greensboro. But we have documentation that the first sit-in took place in Oklahoma City. And you know, in Washington, D.C., they have a National Civil Rights Museum there. And a group, I was unable to go, but a group from our Clara Lupa Legacy Committee went to share with their officers documentation that the city and did take place. We don't want to take away from what happened in Greensboro. We just want you to add what happened here in Oklahoma City. And so it's important for people to know that we had, and our city in, I guess, about five years took place for a period of five years. And when you look at that, and we didn't have the same kind of balance that they had in some of the other areas, especially in some of the other southern states, we had one of the longest non-ballot sit-in events here in Oklahoma City. And we want the world to know that the first one took place August 19, 1958, and that is historic in itself. Okay. Well, and so the uh, the documentary. Would you say again the name of that documentary? Because I it down. Okay, it's called Children of the Civil Rights Documentary Film. Children of the Civil Rights Documentary Film. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. And and uh and like I said, the father Julia Clifford, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Bill Clifford live here in Oklahoma City. Julia Clifford lives in Seattle, Washington area, but she was responsible. And I can send you, I'm going to send you that link, Susan, so you can edit it. It's exactly 56 minutes long. They did show it on uh, uh, OETA, and it has been shown on other stations in the United States. But I will share that. In fact, I do have an extra CD that I can share with you that you can share with others. That would be wonderful. We would love to see that. Okay. Um, Sherry, did you have a question? What are some ways that we can learn to be allies in the civil rights movement? 
Well, many times when you hear announcements of things that are taking place, we think that's for the other person. <laughs> so my recommendation would would be to extend yourself to some of the events that you hear about. Uh, and they vary from time to time, from place to place. And when you hear those things, then visibility really to me so important. I like to see diversity in a group. I don't care where I'm, if I'm looking at a commercial, I'm looking for diversity. If I'm in some program, I'm looking for diversity. And so when you find yourself involved in events where you are not segregated, you are in the right place. That's what I tell people. So when you find that, uh, what, what can you do? When you hear anything of interest, take advantage of it. And don't think, oh, well, that's for somebody else. That just may be your, your nick in this whole discussion about civil rights. Uh, civil rights at one time, we thought it didn't include everybody. But as we know civil rights today, it's inclusive. It is not excluding anyone. So anytime you hear of something and you wanna be a part of it, be a part of it. If you go and feel excluded, then you really ought to be included in that particular organization because nobody wants to exclude for any particular reason because it's a sign of segregation in my books. That's what it is. So it's important when you say, what can we do to be included? Uh, there are so many ways. I can't just say, do this, do that. You may even go to an African-American church one day just to see what is their service like. African-Americans come to your church. Just include yourself in diverse settings and you'd be surprised how enriched you become. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any other questions out there? And let me share something else while, while they're thinking of questions. I, as I look at social media today, and it doesn't take but a seed to get something started, now that you have social media, how important it is to know the power of social media. And I say that because when you hear a march is taking place in this state, a march is taking place because of someone being killed or marches, I tell people all the time, marches will get the message out. But I come back to make sure when you are marching, you are a registered voter. And I say that because we can complain about many things, but if you're not a registered and a voter, then you don't have the right to complain. And that is one of the ways that we voice our concerns about anything. I don't believe it was meant for us all to be on the same page, to all think alike. That's not what I'm thinking we are to be about. But I do know how important it is for us to respect each other, regardless of my thoughts, et cetera, without thinking we've got to be violent with each other. The one thing about the civil rights movement, and I don't care what goes on, we were taught to be nonviolent. So you cannot justify, in my mind, being violent regardless of what the issue may be. I just believe that we can solve problems without being violent. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. And mm -hmm. by having conversations, that just something as small as that, you know? Yes, yes. 
I uh, in in that documentary film, I was listening to Frost Detroit talk about his experience in the military. At one time, of course, the military was segregated, and they changed where they required your other mate had to be of another race. And at one point, his brother was in the military and was killed in the military. And the person that hugged and helped him through it was his mate who was an African-American. He said, now, it didn't matter that he was African-American. It mattered that he cared enough about his feelings to hug him and to express his condolences and all of that. So it, it's not about race all of the time. I think if you understand we all have the same needs, then it makes us better people with each other because we all have the same needs and that's to be included and not be excluded. I just wanted to share that story with you. I love that story. And, uh, you know, Joyce, the, as human beings, there's so much more that we have in common than what we, how we are different. So much. That's, <laughs> yeah. That is true. That is so true. We loved, we want our kids to do well. I'm a grandmother of five. I, I'm married to my husband going on 54 years. Oh. I have two sons. And when you look at my family structure, you look at your family structure, you want the best for them. I want the best for mine. And and to me, that doesn't have anything to do with race. I think that's a, a human desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just do, I am curious about when, uh, and you may not have an idea of a date, but the, the Freedom Center and the Plaza, are we within a year of having those or two years? Or what do you think the time frame might be? Okay, the MAPS 4, we all know what impact economically that will uh, are, is having. Yeah. Because MAPS 4, you don't do any projects until the money is there. You're not building anything, hoping the money is coming in. So when you start looking at the way funds are coming into MAPS 4, I'm pretty sure they're not on target because of the uh, COVID-19. But at this point, I'm saying it probably won't happen within three or four years because it takes that long. And, there, and, and those of you up to date on MAPS 4, you know, there were many projects in that MAPS 4 uh, sales tax. So don't have a timeline on the F Civil Rights Center, but just know when it when they break dirt, they will have the money. And so we just have to keep up with the media on uh, when, when, when we hear that they are getting ready to do the ribbon cutting for that. For the Clara Lupa Plaza, we are at, at this moment now looking at the design that we want to go in that area. If you walk by that piece of land right there north of the Internal Revenue, you see great big old rocks that are positioned there. Well, we're looking at how to position the plaza so if you're walking down Robertson, if you're walking down Main Street, uh, you will be able to look in there and it's it's wide open. It will be wide open. Go in and see some of the famous quotations Clara Lupa uh, gave. You will see statues of 13 children and you will see a statue of Clara Lupa. And right now we're just, I would say within two, three years of that taking place uh, because it is a slow process. We're looking at the design now, but this is funds. We will need funds for this to be completed, but the mayor appointed John Kennedy and Pastor Lee Cooper 
to head this particular committee. And that was done a year ago. So we've been a year in action, I'll say it like that. Okay. So I would within three years. It's not an easy task that I'm finding out. And so that one is uh not through not under maps for it's going to No, be no. That 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 didn't have anything to do with maps. That was in place before maps four. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now I'm conscious of that your church is starting in six minutes. Thank you. Yes. You have something important going on there this morning, and so uh, we want to make it timely for you to get off of one meeting so that you can get to your next event. So, uh, I appreciate it's been, it. yes, it's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful having you with us. We have loved having you with us, and I look forward to getting to sit down with you in person and uh, having a visit. And meanwhile, know that I'm praying for your mother, Fanny. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, I'm here at their home uh, oh. to do this. And the, the reason is, as you know, I have no electricity due to the wind, uh, the transformer out in my area. But uh, still, she was in the hospital. And of course, she's out now and we're taking care of family. But my church is celebrating St. John CME under the pastor of my pastor's Reverend Anthony L. Walker. We're celebrating our 76th church anniversary today. So that's what I'm getting ready for. Well, let, uh, let, let you know that here at St. Paul's Cathedral, we are joining in the celebration with you. We're Thank you. Thank you. The celebration. <laughs> Thank you all for having me and let's have a good day and a good week, okay? Okay, okay Joy, see you soon, I hope. Okay. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.